Good evening. Um, welcome to our conversation, what is next for journalism and political communication. Thanks for coming, for joining us this um, evening. Um, I'm Sylvia Weisbord, the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. Without further ado, let's start our conversation. I would like to introduce the moderator of the panel, my colleague and friend, Peter Loge, who then will introduce this uh, amazing lineup of, of panelists. Um, Peter Leuch is an associate professor in the School of Media and Public Affairs. He's the director of the project on ethics in political communication and a strategic consultant. Peter has spent more than 25 years working in politics and strategic communication, including serving in senior staff positions in the US Congress and at the FDA at the end of the Obama administration and advising, helping run and managing a range of public and private sector organizations. Peter regularly appears in national and international media. His book, Soccer Thinking for Management Success, debuted as number one new release on Amazon. And also last summer, Roman and Littlefield published Peter's edit edited textbook, Political Communication Ethics, Theory and Practice. Welcome again, Peter, take it away. Thank you so much, Silvio. Thanks everybody for joining us this evening, for staying in for what should be a fascinating conversation about the future of, of politics and journalism, what it's gonna look like in 2021. Uh, the 2020 election wasn't quite like any election we'd seen before, but, but it came pretty close. Uh, the past month has been a little bit crazy in American politics, who we are as a country, who participates in the debates, the role of journalism, the role of political communication, how all of this functions are really uh, up for debate. These are things that, are, that we're talking about all of the time. And I'm incredibly lucky to be joined here this evening by some really smart people. Uh, the, the best part about teaching the School of Media and Public Affairs at GW are the remarkable students, some really smart, interesting young men and women who um, came to GW to, to change the world and to report on changing the world. And based on the ones I know now and our alumni, uh, the future looks good. The second favorite part is uh, are my colleagues, uh, some incredibly smart, dedicated, good people um, who are committed to their students, committed to their field, and really believe in the intersection of theory and practice. I think you can go big on both. And I'm thrilled to be joined by, by several of those colleagues tonight. I'm gonna introduce them in order of appearance. Uh, first is Dante Chinney who's a journalist in residence here in the School of Media and Public Affairs. He's a, uh, he runs the, um, the uh, National Communities Project, the American Communities Project rather, which looks at who we are as a country using big data to sort through where we're gathering, how we're moving, who we claim to be. Noting, for example, that, that urban areas 500 miles apart may often have more in common than they do with rural areas just 50 miles down the road. In addition, uh, Dante does political data reporting with the Wall Street Journal. He works with NBC's Meet the Press. He's an award-winning journalist. He's an author, um, and he's really committed to figuring out how to tell how to tell America's stories and figure out who we are. Second is uh, Professor Rebecca Trombel, relatively new to SMPA, joined us about a year and a half ago from Leiden University. Professor Trombel is one of the world's leading authorities on the other place where Americans live and where Americans do politics, and that's right here online. Um, she consults with governments and companies about data platforms, data privacy issues, uh, bad actors in the system, global disinformation. It is uh, Professor Trombel's work is is among the best is among the highest regarded uh, in the world. Uh, she is, leads two interesting projects. One is the Twitter Healthy Conversations Project. We all look forward to learning more about how to handle that. Um, the second is the Institute for Data Democracy and Politics here at the George Washington University, which looks exactly which looks at what the title suggests it looks at, the role of data and, and information um, in, in our politics and our political democracy. The recent events they've hosted include a global online harms webinar uh, on vaccine hesitancy a few weeks ago, a session on the Capitol riots, QAnon and the internet, in October, a session on digital citizenship in a pandemic. So she's gonna help us understand what these platforms mean, where we go with them, what policies ought to be part of them, and what this means for politics, for journalism and political communication. Finally, we're joined by, by Frank Maizano. Frank is an adjunct professor here in SNPA. Um, he comes out of the world I come out of, which is politics and, and political advocacy. Uh, Frank is at Bracewell, 
where he founded the uh, strategic communications um, division of, of the firm, co-founded the strategic communications practice at Bracewell in 2003. He's one of the nation's uh, leading strategic communications uh, consultants in the fields of energy, renewable energies, re renewable energy in the energy industry in general. Uh, his weekly e-newsletter, his weekly uh, newsletter is, is a must read for journalists, advocates, and policymakers. Um, I get it. It's a fascinating read to find out what's going on and what's actually the day-to-day -day of the politics. Before going into private practice, Frank spent about a decade on the Hill as a communications director, uh, both on the House and Senate side for Republicans, including uh, for a number of leading Republicans, including Congressman uh, Nolenberg, Congressman Rogers, Congressman Roth, Congressman Shute, and he started his career in the press office of Senator Richard Lugar. So long and distinguished career on the Hill. And he's going to help, help us understand how all this works, right? The good data mapping, the good journalism, the good research that, that Rebecca and Professor, or the, the Professor Trumbull and Dante do informs the day-to-day, -day, the grind of politics, actual lobbying. And we're going to get Frank's perspective on that. I'm also going to be taking questions from you. If you have questions, put them in the, uh, in the Q&A. We'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we've also got questions ahead of time from friends and colleagues around the country that we'll throw into the conversation. But I have to point out uh, a couple of other uh, technical pieces, and then just I just can't resist doing this one. Um, the first is this session is being recorded. It's going to be up online. Um, after this session, we'll email over when it's edited and, and prettied up. We'll email a link to it to everybody who's who's registered for the event, as well as to Twitter handles of our of our panelists and anything else that comes up that we think think the group might be interested in. Um, finally, I, I have to not quite finally, but I also want to give a special shout out to those of you who are attending who are members of SMPA's National Council, a group of working professionals, uh, leaders in their fields in media, public affairs, and political communication, who help SMPA students and faculty. Um, do our jobs as well as we can. So very special thanks to all of you who are joining us. And finally, because I, I just can't resist pointing this out, in addition to everything else, uh, Washington remains an incredibly small town, something we learned a week or so ago when we all met to sort of warm up for this session. It turns out that Dante's father was Frank's high school civics teacher. Do with that what you will. So with that, Dante Chinney, what is the American community? What's the state of all of this? What is our political and journalistic landscape? Uh, well, uh, first, let me begin by saying Frank is just one of many of my father's former <laughs> students that I meet all over the place. And uh, I, whatever I do in my life, I will never achieve what he achieved, which is uh, all these minds he influenced who just come up and tell me he was a, he was their favorite teacher. Well, uh, I was his favorite, you know that. Doug. Of course, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, the American Communities Project, let me explain it, come at it for this way. <clears throat> uh, I've, I've been a journalist for a very long time now, too, too long, I guess 30, 30 years. And uh, I, it rose out of my idea that we, we needed to understand the country more than beyond red and blue. Red and blue is just, it's, it's a way of keeping score. It's how we know who won the game, but it really doesn't tell us much more than that. I, as Frank did, grew up outside Detroit. Um, if you look at the uh, Wayne County or, or the city of Detroit in Ann Arbor, the, the Democrat will win by the same margin in those places roughly, but they are radically different places and they're driven by different points of view. So what we did is we took all these different data points and we 40 different data points and used it to break all the counties in the country into 15 different types of places that I think really allow us to see this, the, the socioeconomic and political fragments, fragmentation going on in the country. That all said, wh where are we right now after 2020? <clears throat> well, first of all, we're in the midst of a realignment. I firmly believe that uh, every bit of data I look at screams that at me. Uh, that they're both parties have fissures in them. Uh, they are, and they're they're real. I mean, the Democrats. Uh, the, I mean, I, I will say this: like the Democrats' fissures right now are what we've come to expect from the Democrats. The idea that like there's a part of the Democratic Party that's younger and very liberal is not, you know, that's not major news. We've known this for decades. But the thing going on, on the Republican side is is more interesting, uh, and it is it is kind of a uh, there there is a fight within the party between the part of the party that's growing, which is blue collar. Um, uh, it's where I grew up actually in Macomb County, Michigan, kind of blue collar, uh, middle income, not necessarily low income, lower income, but middle income to lower income, uh, not as many college degrees and the old Republican party, which was, you know, folks in white shoes who golfed and drank wine. Um, so what does that mean going forward? It means that it's gonna be a very turbulent, in my opinion, 
decade. We're going to see, uh, it's, I've, I've been saying this for a while, it's been, I've been proven right completely along the way. It's, it's going to be a turbulent, if you've liked the last couple of years, it's going to get really bumpy. So get ready for that because as parties sort through themselves and sort through what they're going to be, there's a lot of displacement. On top of that, there's technological and economic displacement going on. And what that means in terms of going forward is, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think we're going to get a lot more January 6th. I hope we're not going to get a lot more January 6th, but that kind of tension is going to be in the air. And as journalists, our job is to get outside of Washington and be able to report on what's going on and show that to the country. Because I think they're just, we get wrapped up too much in like people and personalities in Washington, DC. We need to get out and find out what's motivating them, what's behind all that. And it's these larger socioeconomic and cultural factors that I think are really driving the uh, realignment of American politics. Very interesting, very interesting. So a lot of that, a lot of how we participate in politics is of course where we live in these uh, blue collar communities. Uh, but a lot of it, Professor Trombley, is where we live online and how we interact online. And of course, not everybody participating online is actually a person or necessarily where, they're, where they claim to be. What, can you explain this? <laughs> Um, do we have a whole week? <laughs> Maybe I can start to explain it then. Um, but, but let me give you a, a little bit of setup here. Um, <clears throat> I've been studying the, the way that people talk with one another um, about politics online um, for a very long time now. Um, you know, 2020 and 2016 certainly drew a lot of national um, and even international attention to issues like abuse and harassment, incivility, um, intolerance, uh, disinformation, just general toxicity online. But all of this has been online since well before 2020 and even before 2016. Um, some of the first research that I did actually you know, was, was interested in, it started from a question about um, whether and to what extent <clears throat> politicians in different countries were willing to engage with their constituents, with citizens directly in conversation online, in back and forth, back and forth exchanges, rather than just broadcasting information, what was the extent to which that they were engaging in real conversation um, with, their, with citizens of their countries? And what I found um, very quickly and, and very clearly was that the US was a real outlier when it came to, to these phenomenon. That in the other countries I studied, um, the UK and the Netherlands, um, that the politicians were engaging in these back and forth conversations. And of course, I looked at all sorts of potential explanations for this. And the one that stuck, the only one that made sense was the degree of incivility and toxicity. That there was so much ugliness already in 2013 on Twitter being directed at politicians that they simply were not willing to engage. It was not a safe place for them to engage. What's interesting is that that was very much driven by the, the citizenry, right? The average person. And this wasn't a point at which we were really worried about bots so much. Um, to be honest with you, I don't think we need to be that worried about bots today even, but that's, that's a bit of a different story. Um, <clears throat> But what we've seen really fundamentally change, even in the US environment in the last um, four or five years, is that politicians themselves have now taken on this toxic tone. Um, they're directing it at their colleagues. They're directing it at the media, of course. They're directing it at other citizens um, in a way that now means that it's, it's incredibly difficult um, to imagine how we kind of pull back from this. Because you know, at a stage, at a point at which the, you know, most politicians were kind of staying above the fray, um, you, know, you could think you could have some hope. Um, but now we're in a place, and of course it's not all politicians all the time online, but it is, it's more the rule than the exception these days. Um, and, and that sort of shapes the entire landscape that we're looking at now. So we've got a physical landscape where we're reshuffling, we're going through a realignment. We have an online landscape, which is getting really tricky and very difficult. And you can see questions and comments coming in in, in the chat and the Q&A, which hopefully we'll be able to get to. But now, Frank, you live in the world of of day-to-day -day politics. And I know that um, some people are already asking about your newsletter. I'm sure 
we'd be happy to have that included in a follow-up email. But this week, for example, you didn't talk about anything that, that Dante or Professor Trumbull were talking about. You're talking about confirmation hearings. You're talking about rulemakings and golf. Like, has, is all this outside politics really actually changing the, the day-to-day of the politics on the Hill? Yeah, you know, Peter, there's so many different things that impact our ability to successfully uh, manage how we relate to Capitol Hill. Um, you know, it's important to note what uh, Rebecca's doing because right now the internet and social media affects everything as much as anything else. Back when I worked on Capitol Hill, of course, we didn't have the internets. I always joke with my students it hadn't been invented by Al Gore yet. They always get a good laugh out of that one. But, um, you know, in reality, it didn't impact us. We sent letters back in those days, and I might be time dating myself, but, you know, the reality is we, we dealt with reporters through faxes and calls, and we dealt with constituents through letters and postcards and town meetings and things like that. So the, the, the environment has changed dramatically on how constituents relate. The environment has changed dramatically on how members and lobbyists and industries relate. Um, to, to Dante's points, there's so many people now who, you know, can, I, I, when I worked for Toby Roth in Wisconsin, he always used to make this point to people to talk about how technology was impacting their ability to, to, to contact him. You know, he used to say that somebody called him from their cell phone and they had him programmed in, right? Which of course, in the, in, the, in the early 90s was, you know, really avant-garde, right? So today we're in just such a strange environment and there's so many opportunities for good information and good contact, but with that comes opportunities um, for misinformation and bad information. And one of the things that we in the, in the, on the lobbying, the public relations side have to manage is how we effectively can determine what is good information and what is bad information and, and, and guard against the bad and, pre, and, pre, and present the good. So, you know, there's so many things that are happening and so many news hooks and, um, and points where you have to make a connection. And you, you mentioned a few, the confirmation hearings, right? Now at a confirmation hearing, you're never gonna get a lot of really good detail, right? Because um, they're two hours and members ask a lot of constituent based and, and, and you know, interest based questions. Uh, the guy who or the woman who is um, managing is, uh, is being nominated tries to dance away from just about every question they can get pinned down on other than saying, sure, we're happy to work with you. Right. So, you know, but the whole exercise creates opportunities for constituencies to get their issues out. Um, and talk about them with media, with uh, other members, with uh, social media outlets. And, and we saw a lot of that in the Wednesday congressional hearing with uh, Michael Regan, who, is the, who has been nominated to be the EPA administrator. You know, there was a whole wide array of folks from the environmental side and from industries who were talking about um, PFAS chemical issues, because that's a big issue that came up. There was a whole uh, advocacy talking about specific and individual issues related to the ethanol industry and the renewable fuel standard. And, you know, there's a big battle between refiners and ethanol folks over that. So, you know, these things create opportunities for you to reach out and dig in. And, you know, those constituency based issues that Dante was talking about, they come from the ground up, right? Um, no, but and, I want to I want to I want to actually interject with it because you raise an interesting point, right? Professor Trombull was arguing, as I as I understand it, that a lot of what's going on online feeds the offline, which then feeds the online. So these aren't parallel worlds, but they're symbiotic worlds, right? And as people are pointing out in the chat and the Q&A, politics has arguably gotten more tribal, right? We talk about filter bubbles, you talk about the bubble of DC, you follow who you want online. And so Frank, as a former comms guy, like I'm with you, right? Coming out of the House and the Senate back in the day, but your day-to-day, -day, you're the recipient of the politics that Professor Trumbull and Dante are talking about. I mean, Professor Trumbull, is this, is Frank seeing what you're talking about when you say the online bleeds to the offline and that intersection? Yeah, I think that that's, um, you know, that's something that, that is absolutely essential for us to keep in mind um, throughout these conversations. I think we too often 
tend to try to put these things into you know separate buckets as if the online were only the online and it exists there in its own sphere and we can discuss it without actually thinking about not just how it bleeds into but actually overlaps with and and is part of you know the offline too um, especially in the sense that you know i think when we talk about the online we tend to treat it almost as if it's at least slightly unreal in some way, right? Or it's not as real as what we might, you know, the, the sort of conversations we might engage in, the interactions we might have in real life. Um, but the truth is what's happening online now is as real as what's happening offline. And the two are inextricably linked, absolutely inextricably linked. Are you seeing this play out, Dante? And if so, oh, looking at a question in the, in the chat, um, has that, are we past the point of local politics? Like how does, what's your take on both the chat, the sort of the romanticism and longing for a time with local news, but also what Professor Trombley is talking about? Well, I mean, the news is still local. There, there is still such a thing as local news and there are local, there are issues that affect local communities differently. But the thing that's absolutely fascinating is the tribalism. I mean, you talk about, you know, we're not moving toward tribalism. We are deep in tribal territory right now where it's not really, I mean, Honestly, as a reporter, there's a lot of things I like to do. But uh, but the, the thing that makes sense is if we want to talk about what's going on in the country, we should talk about what to fix in terms of policies, right? How do we fix policies? What's the policy discussion? Because journalists really do like to cover that stuff. It's not just, we don't just like elections. So, you know, like, so how do you cover policy? People take positions that don't really make a whole heck of a lot of sense. The policy, the, the policy arguments at the local level have gotten distorted where it's almost before you figure out whether or not the policy is even good for you, or you, you almost, people check with what they're supposed to think. This is what I get from when I talk to people. What am I supposed to think about this? And then they come back and they parrot something back to you. Very rarely when you talk to somebody now, do I, do I feel like when I talk to them, they're giving me, they, they're honest to God's straight opinion. It's like, I talk to them and I hear like, oh, you watch Fox. Oh, you watch MSNBC. I, I know where this is going. I. It's like, I've heard, you know, and it's just taking your notes. You're like, yeah, yeah, I know. I know what you're going right. to say. I know what you're and, I, and I think, Peter, that that gets to what I was kind of referring to when you have um, good and bad sources, you have tribalized sources, as you say, which then impacts everything that we do and undercuts our, our thinking, as Dante said, because that's the way we we're supposed to think, or that's what people in Macomb right. County who are union members think, right? Um, that's why I'm supposed to be pro-life, even though I'm a Democrat and, um, and I, 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 I'm not going to vote for Obama, right? So, you know, that, that, that kind of tribalism plays out and it, it always has been reflected from the time David Bonnier was in the House. You know, he was one of the more liberal members in the House of Representatives back in the day, but yet he was a very pro-life activist, right? And Dante and I probably know more about that just because we were from that area. But he was one of the anomalies that just probably doesn't exist that much anymore because of this kind of bifurcation of, you know, of, of political beliefs and the ability to sell it to whoever you can sell it to. And that's inherently what's become a more difficult challenge for people going up to Congress and trying to influence them or trying to, you know, provide them with better information. And just and really quick and then I'll stop. The reason is that like to have a policy discussion, to have the, the discussions that Frank's talking about, you have to be able to talk about why. Why do we wanna do something, why? And the whys, when you talk to people, immediately go back to, they're reading off a list of stuff that they've been told to think. Their whys don't, aren't really connected to reality, at least in my humble opinion. So I want, that actually brings up a point that um, a friend of mine emailed me, who's a retired career public affairs officer at a federal agency. Um, he was one of the civil service guys whose job it was to promote frankly, kind of boring science stuff. And, and I said, what do you think? We're doing this panel and talking to these smart people. What should I ask them? And he writes, I've been watching CNN in the run up to the election through the insurrection and then the inauguration. The networks and its anchors or commentators have clearly staked out a position on a number of issues and individuals. So a fundamental question, is this traditional journalism? And however you answer that question, does it matter? Like Dante, if people are parroting CNN's talking points, is CNN a news outlet or are they sort of a safety bubble in which I feel comfortable and same for Fox or MSNBC or whatever. Well, I think increasingly, if you're talking about the cable networks, it's, it's like, well, when are you watching? I mean, they have hours where they're kind of doing more news and then they have hours where it's, it, look, the, the nightly shows, 
on networks are, I don't think they make any bones about it. There's, they're, they're done hiding the opinion. The opinion is, is straight up, it's right up front. <laughs> it's actually one of the names of the shows. But uh, so the, the opinion is like not hidden anymore. It's really, it's very much right in front of the viewer. Um, and that is different. And it's because they found out that's what, that's what brings viewers and like people, you know, what, what, what television, and I, I mean, I, I work with NBC, but I will say that cable networks for the most part have become warm blankets for the like cable news networks are warm blankets for people on the left or right who just at the, either you watch something that you hate and you yell at the TV or you watch the thing that you agree with. And it's just, uh, it's like a nice, it's like, well, a nice but, and I do, I do think that there is no doubt that um, during the Trump administration for the last four years, this has been, has been exacerbated, right? It's been worse than normal. I mean, I used to be able to watch CNN during the Obama administration, during the Bush administration, and say, "Well, I disagree with that," but you know, at least it seemed like it was headed in the right direction. In 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 the last four years, especially as it went on, you know, more of the mainstream media outlets took took on Trump because, for whatever reason, you know, you could say he was not telling the truth, or you could say he was. Uh, he was doing he wasn't this a lot of time. Let's be frank. Yeah. A lot of times he just wasn't telling the truth. Well, right, exactly. And so, you know, and they, they wanted to, you know, to truth squat him. And, and frankly, that you, what, it, what it showed was that people didn't care whether he was being truth squatted or not. And that gets right back to where Rebecca has come in and talked about a lot of these types of things, right? They just didn't care whether he was telling the truth or not, because it's what they thought and it's what they believed. And that just makes things harder both on the political side and on the representative government side. So yeah, Professor Trumbull. Well, I was just gonna say, I, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting here is that in, in a lot of um, traditional journalism, right? Be particularly before the Trump era, um, there was, you know, we were actually teaching journalism students to, uh, you know, that, that reporting the news was one thing and opinion was another. And if you were going to have one and the other, you needed to be, right, to, to be an honest broker, you needed to be upfront about which was which. And the basic idea behind that was, you know, if you tell people what you're doing, and in one case, this really is opinion, they can then take that in, right, and understand that this isn't the same thing as simply reporting the facts, reporting the news. But I think what we've actually seen in the last four years with the transformation, particularly of a, of a place like CNN, um, is that it probably doesn't really matter, right? If we tell people this is opinion and not kind of traditional hard news reporting, it's still going to be the news to them, right? It will still be understood as the news and parroted back as the news, as facts and so on. Well, this actually then bleeds into something else I want to, I want to poke on, Professor Trumbull, that it's a, um, because, of course, we're on Zoom talking about social media and the impacts in general. It just gets very meta very fast. You tweeted out a link to a study the other day um, on uh, legitimating a platform, evidence of journalist role in transferring authority to Twitter. And the according to the abstract of the study, which I'm sure, you know, uh, using a corpus of US news sources with tweets in them, we provide empirical evidence for our argument of the power of platforms to legitimate speech and shape journalism. The study illuminates journalists' role in transferring some of the press's authority to Twitter, thereby shaping the participants in a content of public deliberation. So now you've got tr this weird relationship between journalism and Twitter, journalism bleeding into opinion, and me as a consumer think, well, CNN, it's a news show. Yeah, it's, it's opinion, but it really is all just news or Fox or whatever. Yeah, I was really worried when you uh, led that with, oh, you tweeted something out the other day with a link, and I thought, oh, quick scan. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get to the Union Berlin Bundesliga <laughs> conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great study. I'm glad you, you picked that one. Um, you know, Twitter is an interesting place. I started off at the very beginning answering your very first question, talking about my Twitter research. Um, scholars study Twitter more than any other platform, not because most Americans are on Twitter, they're not, not because Twitter is representative of the American public, it absolutely is not, um, but because it's a very open platform and we have access to the data much more easily than other you know, platforms like TikTok or Facebook, Instagram or whatever. Um, it's the same thing with journalists. 
Twitter is a very open platform for journalists. Plus, right, there's been a culture that's built up over years now of journalists being on Twitter. So it's a space in which they engage and understand. And it's very transparent. It's open, you know, 98% of all tweets are open to the public. So it's accessible. It's something very easy and tangible to report on. Um, and, and the um, study that you cited um, is by uh, scholar Shannon McGregor, um, who has done a number of studies in this area. And each and every time her work consistently shows that journalists continue to, tw to treat Twitter as if it were representative of public opinion, that you can pull right, a tweet out of the ether and report on it as if right, it is representative of public opinion. And we know that that's nonsense, but that's the way it gets reported out. And then because right, in addition to that, these things aren't being fact-checked, they're essentially being tr you know, tw uh, treated as the voice of the people, right? There's no context provided for them, they just stand on their own. It gives them, gives them this added level of authority um, that's incredibly pro problematic. So here again, you know, we see these clear synergies between the online and the offline um, and these online environments really driving how we come to understand the world, despite the fact that they really don't represent the real, you know, the, the broader public opinion at all. What, and, but what I would say though, and I agree with Rebecca completely, um, what I would say though, maybe Dante can address this some too with his research, you know, honestly, two fronts that, you know, Donald Trump became popular because he had access to Twitter and he spoke to those people how he wanted to, right? But in the policy context, we see that same thing happening, right? Um, there is a whole, and I took, I talked about the ethanol industry and the RFS as an example. There's a whole cadre of ethanol related uh, people who, who communicate with themselves through their own media and through Twitter just by talking to the, to, to, to the issues that they care about and that they address and that they pump in to the Twitter feeds of Joni Ernst and you know, Chuck Grassley and people who they need to support them, right? And so it, it becomes a vehicle for advocacy very aggressively um, rather than just this, if you, if you can harness it in some sense, it becomes that vehicle for advocacy that oftentimes is hard to counterbalance, right? Um, especially if the group is big, especially if the group is aggressive, um, you know, you can you can really show uh, impact in some cases um, in the policy context that you just can't show by getting boots on the ground or getting people in the district or you know having you know constituencies do a fly-in uh, with members of Congress. But I want to I want to pull on a couple of threads here, though, Frank. You raise. I'm glad we're back in a world that I understand, frankly, a little bit much better than Professor Trumbull's, and that is how do you use these tools to make it appear as if to a policymaker your side's honestly right? Actually, before the event, a recent SNPA alum emailed a question: Can we expect to see digital lobbying become visible in the future? And I think the answer is no, because it's already happening, right? We can expect it to be see it like a year or two ago. And Frank, the world you and I come out of, if you want to show a policymaker that there's this huge groundswell of support for a thing. And it used to be postcard campaigns. I don't know about you, but I used to make interns count postcards. Absolutely. I was a, I was a chief of staff in the House during Clinton's impeachment uh, when Move On started, and they crashed the House computers. And we were livid. We're like, we agree with you. I'd like to send some email to somebody. The cards, yeah. the cards that we used to get were about the notch, you know, the Social Security notch. Yes. And that we, one? that uh, was the, a massive campaign that senior groups always ran. And you had, you've had this with guns, you've had this with the balanced budget, you've had this with choice on down the line. So is Twitter just like the same as it ever was, just faster and louder? Like Frank, isn't this like a new tool for doing the same well, old you stuff? Know, it, again, I see, I see, as I said, specialty opportunities to, you know, to show um, a massive constituency out there that supports what you're trying to advocate for if you're the ethanol industry, right? Or, or whoever, right? Um, the challenge is, though, that it can be paper thin, and the challenge is that a lot of times members don't aren't aren't the most up to date on it, right? And they're not getting it as much as maybe uh, going out to the district and having that interpersonal relationship. Now, one thing I would say, um, this COVID pandemic has really created opportunities and more reliable 
uh, chances to make things like online lobbying and online uh, com congressional fly-ins and stuff like that and events like this more mainstream, right? So if, if you thought the, the kind of voting changes we saw in, no, in November because of COVID should, you know, were, were, were one of the reasons why we had such a boost in, in turnout, which I suspect it probably was, if you give people more reasons and ways to vote, they'll likely do it, right? So the same thing is happening here. If you're giving people more reasons and likely ways to be able to reach out to their congressman, to be able to, you know, have a voice on something that's important to them, whether it's an issue area or whether it's an industry group that a uh, constituency, a union that they support, they're going to be able to do it more, and they're going to be more likely to do it. And so I think you know, so you're seeing opportunities, you know, explode that have only been exacerbated or, or juiced by um, by the, the the being not being able to be face to face with a lot of people, which would have resorted us to the old style of doing what we were doing. I would say, though, the one thing that Twitter does do is it's much easier to create mirages with Twitter because uh, it's, it's much easier to, to organize people. So, you know, a disparate group of people scattered around the country can meet on tw Twitter and they're like, we are legion. We are 100,000 people. It's like, that's nothing. You, I'm sorry. I'm not saying that's a, it's a fine. It's, it can fill a football stadium, a very big football stadium, but it's just not that many people. But it can feel like a cacophony on Twitter. Like people are coming at you from everywhere. And like, it, so it's, it's, it's an incredible tool for organizing for you guys are talking about, you're talking about lobbying. Yeah, you could, I can imagine it'd be an incredible tool because the difference is for, from the postcard aspect is you can it just, you can bring people in from all around the country. They're already organized around interests. They're already in touch with each other. I mean, this is how QAnon, things like QAnon spread so quickly. Like basically, look man, people that I went to high school with are QAnoners and I get texts from them and emails from them telling me all sorts of very interesting things and they found each other they found this myth and i've watched them become radicalized over time it's absolutely fascinating like so you can you can find a group of people that are receptive and you can pour information on them and and you can raise an army that's not a real army right. and here's the, and here's the real. flip side and here's the flip side to it though you know a lot of the social justice uh yeah. organizing was done the very same way Right. And and the and the beauty of that is you really had people in the streets that were calling for social justice and change where you may not have had that attention had they not had access to those social media networks. So while you can you can point at QAnon as as kind of a way that it organizes and 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 and, and spreads a, a misinformation of sorts, it also can be used for for opportunities for social good too. And you know the, the the hard line difference is how do you draw the line from the guy who's doing what he thinks is social good and and the person who is you know who's the judge of that right? Twitter is not very good. Jack Dorsey is not very good at deciding who's the right political speech and who's good at it. Yeah. And right now they're being forced to be in that situation, right? With whether it comes to issue advertising. Right. which you know has been a, a, an issue in the climate community. The climate activists are outraged that Twitter allows some issue ads for some and not issue ads for others when they should have none, right? So they're, they're putting themselves in a situation of being the, the judge and juror of, of who we block and who we don't block. And I think that's well, a weakness I, for I, I, to be a social I, group. I agree with that, but I do think that look, there are some things where it's a fine line, and this is a little bit like the because like there's look, there's Democrats and Republicans, they have differences of opinion about how policy should be enacted, what they'd like to see happen. These things are part of like, yeah, don't censor that speech. People have to have it out. You know, Hillary Clinton eats babies, and there's a child, there's a child selling ring under Comet Pizza. Right. It's nutters. ludicrous. We call them it's ludicrous. Back in the trafficking so, days. Right, right. So, so we do have to draw a line. So, like, you know. I know social media like Facebook has really resisted this, uh, but like, look, you know, stopping people from pumping out false information. And it's like, well, how do, how do we draw the line on what's false? It's like, some things are going to be a gray area, but some things are not. And, so, and we can at least start by saying that these things, we can't have this stuff out here because it's just not, it's not true. So Professor, Professor Trumbull, we happen to have an internationally recognized expert on answering this precise question. You, you work with these companies, you work with governments, you work with regulators. A few weeks ago, your organization hosted a panel discussion on how technology is an enabler for extremist groups such as QAnon and the Capitol rioters. What do you think? What do we do? 
Yeah, there there isn't an easy answer to that, unfortunately. But um, I think that there are some some really interesting takes now that it's time for the for the U.S. the folks on Capitol Hill um, to to really start exploring. Um, we're in a situation now where you know Frank to to contradict you just slightly. Like in general, I agree with everything that you were saying, but I don't think the platforms have put themselves in the position or actually asked for the role that they now have in front of them, right? This was never part of their design. And in fact, I think they loathe having this responsibility. Um, but particularly in the US, I mean, really truly around the world, but especially in the US, we do not have a regulatory environment um, that can support any answering any of the questions um, that we've now raised. And so it ultimately comes down to the judgment of these incredibly powerful but utterly unaccountable social media platforms to these companies. And in fact, in many of the, the most important decisions, it comes down to a single person, Jack Dorsey, right? Mark Zuckerberg making the call, the final call. It gets run all the way up, right? The, the flagpole to them. Um, I think what we're, what, one of the things I'm hoping is that uh, the US in the next couple of years is going to take some notes from what we're seeing uh, coming out of Europe, out of the European Union, out of Brussels. Um, in December, the uh, European Commission released the draft of what's known as the Digital Services Act. Um, and this is a piece of legislation that really is focused exclusively on platform transparency and accountability. Right, it isn't something that like makes the hard and fast rules about content and content moderation. Um, Europe recognizes they can't do that. And in the US, we're even less able to do that because of the First Amendment. Um, but what it does do is say that, um, you know, we as, as policymakers, as regulators, and the public at large need to much more clearly understand what's going on on your platforms and the potential harms that they're having on individuals, um, groups, social groups, and societies as a whole. Um, and they've got some really smart things going on there that I'm hoping, right, the U.S. will, will learn some lessons from. I want to hear what some of those smart things are, but I also want to bring in a bit of the chat and also another question we got ahead of time. So you can see Professor yep. Phelan, one of our colleagues, is asking questions about, like, don't we have agency as, as people? Aren't I smart enough to know that a pizza joint without a basement doesn't have something nefarious going on in the basement? Another comes from an email comes from um, a college classmate of mine who's a tech venture capitalist, been, uh, invests in a lot of these digital companies, very successful, also very much a privacy advocate. He wrote a comedic thriller, comedic detective story called Knucklehead of Silicon Valley, which is very funny, but gets at a lot of these issues. And once you stop laughing, you get really disturbed. He writes, um, ask about account, where do we draw the line on accountability? For example, is it big tech or Twitter's responsibility to verify speech? Or AT&T, if I'm telling lies to my boss as to my whereabouts on our phones? Or Apple, Samsung, if we use these devices to create the misinformation we occasionally propagate? In the end, tech cannot be held responsible, only people, in my humble opinion. Blaming the hammer for the ruined birdhouse is inappropriate. What do you think, Professor Fallon? Or um, Professor, um, sorry, Rebecca I'm Trombel. Saying, Professor Trombel. Here, I'm looking I'm in two different there. directions. <laughs> I hope, I hope <laughs> Professor Fallon also weighs in. in, in the <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, okay, so it's really, it's really tricky, right? Because um, yes, ideally, you want to leave this up to right the individual um, platform user. Um, you know, we want to put trust in individual judgment. But what we've seen, um, and not, not just on social media, what we've seen in social science research, right, sociology, anthropology, political science throughout the ages, is that people actually aren't the best um, at at discerning, right, information. Um, now, that isn't to suggest that, you know, I'm a proponent of a, a kind of nanny state that, you know, looks over and tells everybody what to think about. But I think one of the biggest issues that, that the platforms have, have kind of drawn to our attention is that it's particularly difficult 
for people to discern um, information correctly when they're in an environment where there really aren't many other options, right? Where they're sitting in echo chambers. And note that I don't use the term filter bubbles because actually the best research on this shows that it's not the platform's algorithms that are putting us in this situation. It's our own choices <laughs> to connect on Facebook and yeah. other platforms with like-minded people, right? We're putting ourselves in echo chambers. Um, so sitting within those echo chambers and then the ability of, um, you know, much the way that Dante was talking earlier, um, the ability for coordinated action and coordinated inauthentic action to kind of surround us then in those echo chambers um, makes for a, a, a really kind of, you know, toxic environment for a lot of people. And so thinking not about, you know, how do we control specific bits of information, but rather how do we understand and rethink the larger environment itself, the system is I think the much better way to get at this. Well, and let me add to, to this, that your, your friend's argument, uh, Peter, is very similar to an argument that the gun industry has made for years. It's not the guns that kill people, it's not the guns that kill people, it's the people. And it's the same argument that um, many in industries often make on climate change arguments when they're being sued um, for, you know, for people driving cars, even though they make the product that the consumer is demanding, right? Because if we stopped making fossil fuels, gasoline, et cetera, you know, the economy grinds to a halt. So, you know, so it's an argument that's old. And I noticed that there, in, in, there's not a lot of new ideas in Washington. There's a lot of recycled ideas, as you know, um, the only guy who tried to create a new idea in Washington was maybe Jack Abramoff, and he ended up going to jail. So, you know, so I, I think we're seeing this play out just in a different way with social media's platforms um, being a part of it. But um, I don't know that I agree that um, that you know on guns, on climate, and on you know tech that you know those those guys are innocent. I think there's um, uh, culpability on on a lot of different sides for everybody. I mean, I, I will say this, like, so as a journalist, uh, I get, I get emails from people and notes from people and some of them, uh, no, nothing has happened to me. And I don't write about things that should be doing this to people. I'm generally writing about data and trying to explain things in just in a very generic sense, but you get emails from people that they have been told something and they believe it to be true. And they, they I've been told I'm an enemy combatant. And like they're 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 gonna come take me the time comes so you know like look it's like well you know he's just missed you know he just doesn't understand and like it's it's just like he should have known better than to go into comet with the gun and shoot the floor it's like well yeah he should have but the bottom line is at some point somebody gets hurt like I just think there there are some things that are I'm not saying they should it's impossible when the way Twitter works you're not gonna be able to monitor everything you're just not. But like, like when there are, when there are things, people that are known for putting out false information, false information, false information, not information that's from one point of view or a slightly different view about tax policy or whatever the heck you want to talk about. Sometimes it's just lies, right? When they start doing that too much, I don't think it's out of Twitter. I don't, I don't think it's, I should say Twitter, you can't stop that person from posting. I think Twitter should be well within their rights to say, this person is just trying to stir the pot. He's trying to create lies. He's lying. He's trying to create problems. And I'm just not. I'm going to take away his right to post for a while. That I guess, the, and to me, Peter, the larger problem, and you probably remember this very well too, these are the black helicopter people that used to write those letters to our congressional yeah. offices all the time, right? They wrote those letters. They were the LaRouche people who used to go with a megaphone and stand on the corner and people looked at them like they were crazy, right? Now their megaphone is social media, right? And that, and that connects them with other people much but, easier right. than it would have sending a letter to their congressman saying that the black helicopters were after him, where we would just kind of say, whoa, okay. <laughs> nice and, well, the organization part, as I was talking about before, about how Twitter can be used to organize disparate people into something they think they have a movement and something's coming forward, something's moving forward. The other thing is that like, look, nobody gets in the journal because they want to be liked. I didn't get into journalism to be liked. That's not why I do this. And, but, and I don't mind hate mail, it's all part of it, but it's gotten to the point now where we're in a climate where things are strange. I don't know anymore. I don't know how real to take. I used to laugh at things like this. I don't know how to feel about it anymore. I'm not sure. All it takes is one person who has a ax to grind. Not that you know. Not that you're you're anybody's even a terribly important person. Just like for whatever reason, they're going to make you pay. And like, what do you do about that? I don't know. So, 
So Professor Trumbull, once again, we come back to, to the question. Um, one, of, one of our students put in the Q&A, what about independent review boards? We've talked, others have floated breaking up the platforms. What do we, you're, you're advising European governments that you say have some ideas that may or may not be applicable here. I, according to my watch, you've got about seven and a half minutes. So what's the solution? Solve all the problems. <laughs> Solve all, all of the them. problems in seven and a half that, minutes. That would be terrific yeah. if you would. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I think that there are two things <laughs> that we need to, to, uh, to do concurrently, right? Um, one is to focus on cracking open the black boxes at the platforms. We know so very little about the way that um, their algorithms are operating. We know very, very little about how policies, right, even more on a kind of person to person level are being devised and then enforced. Um, and we also simply know very little about the way that um, people are being impacted, right? The users on the platforms and, and, and beyond. Um, so there are a number of measures that need to be put in place to crack things open so we can just get a better handle on that. That's the starting point. Um, and, and that's primarily what, what the Europeans are focusing on right now. Um, auditing, right, algorithmic auditing, um, data access for vetted researchers, these sorts of things. Um, in the meantime, while the US is hopefully catching up on some of that, um, I think that there is a place for more kind of democratic citizen accountability with the platforms. Now, I wanna be careful here because I'm not advocating for a, a ver another version of the Facebook Oversight Board, right? That is very much not an independent entity. Um, the way Facebook set that up, right? They've got all sorts of great experts on there, but it really is Facebook in control ultimately. And it's an advisory board, right? They can completely ignore anything that comes from the oversight board. I think we need um, uh, citizen accountability boards or whatever we might call them with real teeth. Um, ultimately, it's actually going to have to be the platforms that choose to do that themselves. Um, they can structure it in a way to, you know, kind of create a separation between themselves and the, the, the advisory councils. Um, but I think they may be, to some degree, interested in doing more of that now, because precisely what we saw after January 6th where you know, Twitter and then Facebook and then everybody is, is running after one another to bump Trump from the platform when for months and years they had been arguing, you know, we just can't do it. Those are the sorts of decisions that they don't want to be making in the first place. So, so does that mean, I mean, Frank, if, if, the, if the decisions are gonna be made by the companies for their own interest, is this the kind of thing that Congress should just leave alone? Because as, as a lobbying, like if our lobbyists, this is a way to buy a boat, right? It's huge amounts of money going to be sloshed around. Well, will, look, there, will anything happen? I think that, you know, I mean, honestly, I always joke with my, my kids uh, are in college. And so they're involved in political discussions in, in the, on the college campuses. And they always ask me questions. And I say, it doesn't really matter who wins for me because I'm going to do well anyway, right? <laughs> That's kind of the reality of where we are. I mean, Joe Biden comes in. Um, it's it's important to our guys to make uh, to be involved and, and engage. And you know, there's been a flurry of early action, right? Um, so people who know Washington and know how to manage Washington and know how to manage policy are always going to be needed people. Depending, you know, and again, no matter who's in power, and that's an argument that we've always made, right? When you're substantive policy experts and you know things about policy, no matter who is in office. You're always going to be more, much more in need and much more useful than, you know, maybe so I'm so and so lobbyist that I worked for Tom DeLay and I know Republicans. Well, Tom DeLay is out, right? So now what do you do, right? So you, you have to have that substantive expertise on a lot of these issues. And that's what's required by these members, right? So, um, and that's what constituencies translate up, right? And that access point for, the constituency, whether it's a labor union, an environmental group, um, a grassroots environmental group, or if it's an industry coalition, right? The reality is they have to have that endpoint, and the endpoint has to make that connection 
and contact in a way that the member can understand, in a way that the congressman, the senator can understand and relate to those people who are important to them. So it sounds oh. like, go ahead. Uh, so, no, so I was just going to say, that's, that's, the, that's the, the path, right? And so no matter, you know, again, it's no matter who ends up taking that spot, it creates opportunities for members uh, to, 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 no matter who's in charge, no matter who, what the policy agenda is, somebody has to be there to try and influence it. So it sounds like our, our country and our communities are changing in interesting ways that Dante and his team are measuring and helping us understand, helping the readers of the Wall Street Journal and NBC understand. Professor Trombull is helping people understand the platforms. The thing that doesn't change is the day-to-day -day politics of Congress and policymaking, because your job is, look, I know how the process works. I know how to explain things. And I know how to sort of advance this through. So is that where we are? Is the thing that doesn't change is politics, but everything else around us changes? Well, I think that's that's a good way of putting it, really, because we're, st you know, all the the engagement point and how the policy works. And this is why one of the and I and I'm, you know, I I have nothing against progressive groups and things like that, right? But one one of the things that they don't understand is. They don't understand how Washington works, and that's why they can have a, a, a rally and have 30 people, 50, 100 people get arrested inside Nancy Pelosi's office, and it doesn't have that much of an impact, right, other than in their social media channels and maybe in some news media, right? It doesn't change the minds of Abby Spanberger and others because they're, they're bound to, uh, you know, what constituents are telling them, and constituents aren't telling them what moveon.org wants, so that's a big piece. Yeah. But why this is those progressives groups are loud but not particularly good at managing this inside game and and really that's one of the reasons that you know it stays the way it is even with the environment as you say changing around it well the one thing i'd say really quickly though is uh, you're talking about two different things the apparatus around politics never changes because the apparatus around politics works at what exactly what Frank's saying. What's the environment? How do I make this work for me? What's the environment? How do I make this work for me? But the environment of politics is changing. It's changing and it's, and so, the, and so the, they're always, the, the apparatus of politics is trying to figure out how to navigate the cross currents and get things done. But there's a whole other part of politics that is just about how people think that what the country is supposed to look like, how it's supposed to operate, what they think the country is supposed to be. And, and that's changing. Uh, and, and I think, I, I think we, we can't, it, it, it's the, the apparatus stays the same, but I think if, if you've looked at how the country, what the, what the conversations are like in Washington now compared to what they were 10, 20 years ago, the politics has changed. It's, it's, it's changed, it's changed in a lot of ways. With that in mind, according to uh, one of my clocks at 7 p.m., we've hit the hour mark. We've raised a lot of really interesting questions. Um, I'm a little, frankly, disappointed that Rebecca didn't answer everything for us. I was pretty sure that Professor Trumbull was going was gonna to do that. Uh, we will be sending a follow-up email to everybody who registered for this event with a video uh, with links to Professor Trumbull's site, Institute for Data, Democracy, and Politics. They're doing a lot of work in vaccine misinformation, for example, really interesting stuff um, to the American Communities Project and to whatever it is that Frank would like us to, to email out as well about his work in the day-to-day -day politics. Um, this has been hugely interesting. I have lots of notes, lots of good questions from all of you in the chat and in, in the Q&A. Um, Professor Trumbull, Dante, Frank, Sylvia, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you very much, everybody. This has been great. Thanks for having us. Catalyst. Thanks, guys. And uh, I, I think that we cover every single issue we discuss in the school. <laughs> we talk about advocacy, media, journalism, policy, this information, everything that we cover in classes, in our research, in our practice, you guys managed to cover in one hour. This is amazing. Thank you very much. And I hope that everybody enjoyed this conversation as, as we did. Uh, thank you. See you next time.